populations are richer than others. Some have access to more resources, like more like highly demanded resources like oil and stuff, which can make them richer. Key answer. Keep that one. Keep it in your brains, that answer. Uh, anybody else have one? one? Yes. The education levels of the country, so they know how to better manage their own money expenditure. Okay, that's a really good one. Didn't think of that one. Yes. Their governments are set up differently. Another key one. Keep that one. He already said the one I was about to say. Yes. The legal systems. <laughs> Another good one. We're going to get into that one. Oh. The value of certain occupations. That's gonna fit into what what um, some other person um, said. I can't remember at the moment. Um, but first, um, with that, we're going to talk about economic growth. Uh, anybody have a good understanding? I guess I know it seems pretty simple. Economic growth. Anybody want to try to put it into words? Anybody? Well, then, since you all just want to <laughs> say it all at once. Uh, it is an increase in the amount of goods and services produced over a period of time. Um, this is measured in the rate of the real gross domestic product, um, which, will, which is basically the value of goods produced and services rendered. Um, and going to what you said, I believe, um, is that to the original question, one of the more known factors of why, of why countries are wealthier is because um, this is going to be a big one, very big one, it's going to come up a lot is going to be natural sorry it's going to say natural resource yeah resource endowments so natural resource in dow and okay so wow basically that's just a big nice little sat word for just saying resource resources like wood coal um, iron, metal, things such as that, that people usually take from their countries. Now, people usually, you would think that that's the reason why some are poor. But that is a common misconce misconception. Because, actually, that's a small one, but there are things that we call call institutions. Um, and institutions is no, we're not talking about like a school or a facility. No, we are talking about, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Institutions, which is just basic rules, customs, practices of society, um, laws, basic, um, if you will. Um, and with all of this, then that will lead um, also into the... La, 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 la. Wow, I just lost my place. Um, yes, thank you. Um, these institutions will encourage individuals for physical capital, which is, which is basically buildings, machinery, etc., and human capital, which is experience, um, work service, um, and such and such. The legal side of the institutions can be divided, though, into two into two models, which <coughs> are the big keywords that we use here. One is common law. So one is a common law, and then one would be civil law. I cannot spell. One could be civil law. Look at why. <laughs> um, so, um, basically, what we usually <coughs> consider for common law, common law is your usual, um, would be considered more freedom, more freedom of the um, judicial system is more of in charge, um, and less, sorry, less power of the state. Um, civil law will be more of a stronger central government than a judicial branch. So, um, there are some countries under common law. Um, they are mainly sometimes used also as um, British common law and and French common law, which we'll show in a second. So, like some common law would be such as us, the U.S. or um, New Zealand. So, or New Zealand or the U.K. and things such as that. I'm sorry, I'm trying to write fast. It's not pretty. I'm bumping into everything. Um, and then some other ones, as of course you heard, um, wait, are wait, like wait, France. Wait, wait, ask them, ask them. Ask them? Yeah. Oh, okay. Countries. Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, any civil, you have one? Egypt. Somebody read the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> 
Either that or y'all are right now just cheat cheating off of the book while I'm not looking. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering where would Russia fall? Would Russia be civil law? Um, yes, actually, correct. Russia is under civil. Russia would be under civil law, at least historically. <coughs> um, the um, and I believe it is today. Yeah, I think it is. Um, but that's good. Another one is Russia. That's right. Uh, anybody else said anything? Yes. Mexico. What'd you Mexico. say? Yes, Mexico. Which one would that fall under? Civil. Is it? I believe so. Yes. I'm thinking of another end, probably. Then you got Mexico. Mexico. Mexicano. Good old southern border. Um, blah, 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 blah. What was I going to say? As this all planned out. Um... Uh, so ah yes. So when we so we're talking about um we're talking about wealth. Wealth will come from uh usually comes from and depends on as somebody said the political side, legal side, and economic constitu um economic institutions such as natural resource endowments um and things such as that. Um institutions such as political stability um. Protection against violent uh, against violence or theft, uh, security of contracts or freedom and freedom uh, from regulatory regulatory burdens, um, um, private property rights um, are key contributors more than um, natural resource endowments. As I said before, that seems like it's the main answer, but actually that's just a small a small thing. Um, and so some would also want to argue that common law is sort of the best way to go. It's the new fad. Um, it, and because research has found um, that economic growth is one-third higher in common law nations um, rather than in civil law nations. And property rights are also, once again, much stronger in common law countries. Um, institutions, though, were a result of colonists, of colonists that were um, coming over, yes, coming westward, coming westward, um, I'm so sorry. Um, so such as common law nations such as North America, New Zealand, great economies due to also their geography and all of and the healthy climate they have and um, that showed a really high standard of um, high standard of living and also was very attractive to, to the settlers. Um, and so which is where sorry, thanks. Um, and such as with that, then the common law institutions, with they would create there so that way that they can keep that property that they saw really beneficial, really profitable. They wouldn't want to give that to whoever they came from, such as Spain or the or or Britain and things such as that. Um, so they would so they instituted these institute they instituted these institutions. Wow, it's a funny way that that happened. Um, to make sure that they could keep their own land, and so that way that that could so that way that could raise as well. That also was a thing that happened um, early in Brit, early um, <coughs> in the UK, mainly Britain, um, where back in the times of the monarchy, where usually they didn't, where they started wanting to create common law institutions that would that would allow them to control that their free market rather than letting the queen and the king have control over all of what they wanted to sell and did. And of course, as we see, that kind of worked out. Um, and on the other hand, though, civil law can be unpredictable. Um, its structure can really change, especially in the term of property and contract rights, um, which causes people to be very reluctant, reluctant on making long-term investments, such as, you know, if you know that the police aren't going to help protect your house or your car, you're less likely to make a car. If you don't know what's going to, how the economy, or even a smallest hint of how the economy is going to look, whether it's going to go down or up, you're not going to make a decision of how or what investments you want to make, or if you want to get a certain job in some in some way or another. It is little incentive. Keyword for the school year um, on <laughs> on long-term property rights systems. Um, um, also, when you can't, yeah, basically what I said, um, 10 years due to inconsistencies. Um, 
I know one one thing, one main thing of why um, it, with your small, with the, I'm so sorry that I gave you all that really long writing. I forgot to tell you guys the certain two certain topics. I know you guys looked at that and y'all practically almost dropped the class. Um, <laughs> um, but I found, but um, in the why nations fail section of it, the nations will usually wait, fail economic. Wait, wait, wait. I want you to have a little bit rest. I'm going to ask them, okay? <laughs> All right, so, you, I mean, the two sections, I mean, I know I sent you guys are pretty late, but it's not a rich long section, mm -hmm. you see, right? Okay, so what do you think from Excuse reading you know, that particular article he was just mentioning, what do you think the problem with the civil law, in addition to what he already mentioned? What's the problem, Jamie? I think that civil law is mainly for the like the social elite to keep their power at the expense of others. So it's not really upwardly mobile and you can't really move. Mm -hmm. Good. You're kind of stuck where you are. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say the government has too much power. Okay. So what's the problem of having too much power? Why that would be a problem? Absolute power corrupts. Hmm? Absolute power corrupts. Corrupts. So, tell me what you go ahead. <coughs> I was gonna say that only one person was in control of certain <coughs> things, so there was no competition, and without that competition, there was no productivity, so they couldn't move forward. So they're at a standstill, and that's why their economy can't grow that's like right. the other countries mm -hmm. with common law. That's right. So because that one person decides that, or one body decides how to allocate the resources, right? And uh, so they give up the opportunity that uh, you know the people and market to decide what's the best way to all allocate. Mm -hmm. So eventually, you know, the efficiency lost, and uh, just, and so we have the corruption, and we have um, a lot of you know social instability, and a lot of things arise because of the resources are not, not allocated efficiently. Thank you. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Um, oh, um, and so what she said, um, along with that, some, some sort of free thinking ideas about what they were saying, um, about a certain one elite having complete tr control over all of it, making it an extractive, um, what we call an extractive institution, which is, as it's called, an extraction, just taking and taking and not real putting back and making it grow. Um, what do you think would be a, um, a good solution? Um, hint, hint. It was at it's right about near the very end of that section that really basically just gives it plain right in there saying the solution it, um, is. Anybody have any ideas? Yes. Um, I'm guessing like a revolution, like changing the government. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? There are no wrong answers unless they have nothing to do with this. <laughs> you learned that from me, huh? <laughs> um, so, um, it says in the um, article that the solution to the economic and political failure of nations today is to transform their extractive institutions towards inclu toward inclusive ones. What do you think that means? Instead of extractive ones, that you think of inclusive ones. Yes, you. Like the money goes back to the country and it's not being used for unnecessary things and it's going to the citizens mm -hmm. instead of the government. Yes, great. Um, the vicious circle um, then goes on to say the vicious circle means that this is not easy. Vicious, vicious circle meaning as in this really hard cycle of extractive institutions is a hard thing to get rid of because you can always just say, oh, let's go and dethrone the king. Well, now you have your economy's gonna fall apart um, and things such as that. Um, but the vicious circle means that this is not easy, but it is not impossible. And the iron law of oligarchy, or oligarchy, depends on where you're from, um, is not inevitable. <laughs> either some pre-existing inclusive elements in institutions or the presence of broad coalitions leading the fight against the existing re regime or just the contingent nature of history can break vicious circles. I want to um, 
go back a little bit there when it's saying either some pre-existing inclusive elements in institutions or presence of broad coalitions um, leading the fight against the existing regime. Um, what, what examples do you think can come to mind throughout history or anywhere in the world about um, pre-existing inclusive elements in institutions or coalitions that were going against um, a blah, 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 an existing the existing regime to have change, whether that's social or political or economic. Any anybody? Um, the revolutions throughout Russia prior to I want to say World War Two. Please speak louder. I can't hear you. Okay. Um, the revolutions that were happening in Russia, like from the Bolsheviks against the high ups. Okay. Uh, can anybody think of any more? Um, and maybe try to think along the lines of it may be called a war, but maybe even like a non a non violent war, but more of a revolution or a war of economy, whether that's competition or trying to break through with a new idea. Can anybody think of any of those? Yes. Not all at once. Yes. I guess kind of like the movie we watched where it went from big government back to a little government and then back to a big government. So just kind of that cycle of different kinds of governments coming through. Dang. Correct. Right there in the middle of the spot of the target. Boom. Plus 10 points. Awesome. <laughs> Um, yes, that actually is true in the video that we saw that that did make it really a really good example of a revolution between an economic system that just seemed to not be working or maybe just wasn't as growing um, according to the time or whatever was happening such as wartime. Um, things could not work the same as they did before. So instead of just keeping instead of that same and you want change out of that um, what may soon to become an extractive economy can change. Um, you can have unions and pro um, unions, um, protests, petitions, um, creating your own sort of system and introducing it. Um, things, things like that definitely are really good examples. Um, of I'll give you guys another example. You know, I'll give you, you, you know, along the line you were talking about, okay, some um, reform or innovation. Comparing the uh, university system here, and China, okay? And here, the university, the American university, we have what we call faculty governance. Faculty governance. So what it means that, you know, we, 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 in the university setting, we have an administrator and we have faculties. You know, we perform different kind of roles, you know? And uh, on, even though a lot of decision in terms of the rules, how the union should operate, it um, come from an administrators. But we do have what we call a faculty senate, where you know a lot of major decision in terms of a lot of cu um, curriculum, okay, and uh, attendance policy. All those things has to come from the faculty senate, and the faculty senate consists of only faculty. So that's what we call actually faculty and really is a part of decision making process in American University. Okay? And I came from China, you know, I, I did my undergraduate in China. In China, that does not exist. All the decision come from the administrators and faculty did not have that kind of um, opportunity to to really uh, participate in the decision process. Okay, so if someday, you know, I do think, you know, actually Chinese University uh, 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 start looking at, you know, the system here, trying to borrow some of the models here. And that is, this, if that's going to happen, and this transition, and this change, and it will be something what you talk about, about inclusiveness. Okay, so why could you think about it's a major resources in university? Why why would you want to exclude these major resources out of your decision making process? Right? So and when you include faculty into this, then you are utilizing the resources, you know, and and um, and it probably in a way is going to save to save money for the university in the long run and it's going to make it run better. So this is just another example of being inclusive. When we say being inclusive in the article, they talk about the inclusive of the resources. And the resources is include everything, people, machinery, 
and uh, natural resources, everything. Okay. Uh, next, um, for the other for the um, other section of of that article, um, <coughs> development reversed. Um, this is um, less now of a political side of things, but now more of an economical, truly, and especially historical. Um, and this one really does delve into extractive institutions. So can anybody, throughout any of history, you know, it doesn't matter today, beginning of time, um, in the future, uh, can you think of an example of an extractive institution in any, any place or an extractive institu institution in an economy? Anybody? History. Oh, anything that, that happened in the environment that you know of. It does not, you know, he asks you question, asks you to give example in terms of institution, nation. How about in your environment, in your working environment? and your studying environment, your family environment, your friend environment, what, what kind of thing that you think is that kind of extracted instead of inclusive? I'm going to extend your question longer. Thank you. One thing that I think might, I think, relate to it is how we switch to Common Core mm -hmm. when before or during the government, like another state would tell you. Here's what you teach. Like another state would say, here's what you teach. So the states were kind of different, but now they've got Common Core, and it's just like, here's what everyone is like forced to teach in high school. So how would that, um, how would that relate to the extractive or inclusive? It's like the, so making a Common Core is like kind of in a thicker. Uh, so would that be that considered as being extracted or extracted? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got a bit of a weird example from inclusive to extractive, where um, when you're in like the lower grades around elementary school and such, the teachers give you assigned seats for lunch. And so everyone just kind of mixes and mingles within the class. And then as you get older and they start letting you sit wherever you want, you start to create your own little groups and that thus becomes um, extractive. Say it again, Alexandria. Say that example again. Um, when you start in like around elementary school, the teachers give you assigned seats and that kind of mixes the class with everybody else so that you don't really have your own social circle for where you're sitting. But then as you get older and you can pick where you want to sit, you can start forming around your own social group. So this change would be considered as inclusive or extractive? Extractive. That would be more inclusive because then it becomes your own choice as opposed to an outside source. Yeah, but the reason why I kind of view it more so as extractive than inclusive is because you're pulling out what you want and kind of ignoring everything that you don't want, which that's just how I view it. Okay, so this you see that's good. So no one, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and use your own words to explain the meaning of being extracted and being inclusive. And that's, that's stick with that you know, definition for, for a couple of minutes because I think maybe some of the people here still don't quite clear, are not quite clear the meaning of being extracted or being inclusive in terms of the allocation of the resources. Okay, let's, let's go ahead. Use your own words to tell people what, you, what, what does it mean to be extractive what does it mean to be inclusive? And anybody here as well, use your own word to explain what it means here in the article, being extractive or being inclusive. Everyone. Everyone. It's hard, because it's like I get it, so I have to put it in my words. That's right, it's, it's hard when you think how to explain it to other person, right? 
I guess being extractive would be like it's almost like being selfish. Like you keep everything for yourself. Like in grading it says, um, these institutions keep poor countries poor and prevent them from embarking on a path to economic growth. So it's like you don't give them the resources to grow their economy and just keep it to yourself or take away what they have already. And then the other one is intrusive. intrusive. Yeah. intrusive. Um, you give them, you share your resources or you give them resources and help them benefit to help their economy grow. Okay. And also I want to introduce your concept, maybe you guys have heard of this, called Zero Thumb. Zero sum. Zero sum. Have you heard of this? Zero, the second word is sum, S-U-M. So what does it mean is, my gain is your loss. Okay, for example, if we split $10 between me and Jamie, split is $10. If I have $5, you're gonna have five. If I keep eight, you only have two. Zero sum. Why? My gain is your loss. My loss is your gain. The sum remains the same. Okay? So when we talk about distraction, a lot of time is actually has that concept in the place, into play. Because there's this limited amount of resources. I'm gonna take in as much as possible, okay, without concerning the others, okay? And if, it's zero, if you're participating in a zero-sum environment or use a zero-sum kind of game or policy or implementation, of course, the more you're going to get and the, the small amount other people is going to have, right? Okay. However, there is another concept you all heard of. It's called a win-win situation. Okay. What does that mean? That means positive sum. So that means that if, if we use resources in a in an ideal way, I can gain, but at the same time, you can gain as well. So that is called positive sum gain or positive sum environment. So for the instructive they're talking about, more likely the policymaker are engaging in a zero sum kind of environment. You see what I'm saying? And uh, if they uh, do not have the public interest in their heart, of course, the more extract, the less the public to have, okay? But for the in inclusive con concept you're talking about, it's more like a, a, a positive sum game or positive sum environment. So the resource is going to be used in a way that, and you all going to benefit. For example, uh, we own, we have public transportation. I know this town does not have, I mean, Triple Hill has public transportation. Or we have a beautiful park to enjoy. Most of the time it's free, right? And we have like a, in a really safe neighborhood, you know, you have this security that you uh, you benefit from. Think about all these things. All these things can be enjoyed by everyone in that community, right? Okay, but it's not, I mean, the building of that, having a safe place to live, having a beautiful park, having a free public transportation, they all cost money, okay? Where the money come from? Come from taxpayers' money, right? So when we have put the money into the goods like this, this is what we call the positive sum game because the money is going to generate generate more benefit than the original amount, so everybody can benefit from it. Okay. So, and in an extractive kind of uh, environment, you're going to more like seeing a zero sum, and in the inclusive. Uh, the environment you're going to more like see you know more like a positive sum kind of game or environment okay but of course you know to have a positive sum kind of environment or mechanism is requires a lot of uh, uh, planning and it requires a lot of uh, and also um, less interest driven on the plan planners side okay so I just want to throw out that concept in well, thank you. Make, make, does it make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. So because it's, this is extractive and inclusive, the beauty is really important. You know, extractive means you just you just take it. But you know, but.
from the whole point of society point of view, if you take it, it's going to generate more, that's fine. But when you talk about extracted immune system, it's going to stay the same. It's, it's not going to generate more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it, it made it easier for me to um, understand um, extractive with one of the, with the, yeah, yeah. What I'm just I'm looking for with the um, example of basically the um, the slave trade or um, enslaving people base in here in the um, Caribbean islands and the Americas and Native Americans and black slaves. Okay. Um, let's see. So how Europeans came, imported um, imported um, African slaves here, set up plantations here. Cool. It's, I mean, the only time it would ever be a positive sum is, dur is during, um, would be during wars, tribal wars, where people would then capture the enemy and then they would sell them to um, European, European traders for money. That's sort of, that's kind of basically, a, um, I guess you could say a positive sum. But the extractive comes in where, um, bleh, wow, yeah. um, <laughs> lost, there you go, population. Um, Basically, population starts to grow down um, in order then for the man to then all of a sudden want to gain more for the loss of our of our sanity and everything. Power for the people. Um, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, um, and sort of where I guess you could say it could be where then things would then be extractive was when they would come take the gold, the silver, labor, wouldn't give them anything really back except for, hey, you're alive, right? You got, at least you got, uh, you got seven fingers. I mean, you may not have 10, but you got seven, right? you know, things like that. Um, but then came, of course, disease and other things like that. Had to leave, got sick, blah, tummy aches, things such as that. Um, da -da 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 -da. What else, what else will contribute to the um, counts for the instruction. What else? Not asking you, ask everyone here. It's the late thing, you know, we're talking about. <laughs> Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, the question? Yeah. Okay. So he was talking about, you know, um, the problem with the slave trade, you know. So my question is, you know, we just talk about being extractive and being inclusive. We all know that being extractive, right? Mm -hmm. So I just want you to explain, okay? why that is a extractive um, way of using the resources. Go ahead, you, you, you can call them. I just throw out the question, you can call them, yeah. Hey. Um, basically it's extractive because slaves are doing all the work, but then the owner of the slaves is just taking out all the profits. So like any kind of, anything that the slaves do there's no upward mobility. They're just taking it out. That's right. There's no growth yeah. for the resources. The, the slaves. The slaves are resources. You know, they're people. They're resources. But there's no growth there. Right. And also there is no um, conservation of the natural resources where the land actually, you know, we, as you would talk about, you know, and the mining, you know, and also the um, mining and the issue and also the, the disease. And all this due to, you know, they are, okay, we just want to use the resources. I don't want to um, provide the environment where those resources are going to be maintained, you know? And so that's why it is there, and the uh, slaves are not going to become more educated, and uh, also that um, the community is not going to um, have any kind of economic. So in my eyes, everything is resources. Okay, in my eyes, everything. When I see the use of the resource, the utilization resource in their team, I think, okay, is this resource is going to grow? I mean, you, you, first we have this much resource. After a while, are we going to grow more based on what we had before? Okay, this more could be the human capital. What is human capital? The, the book mentioned human capital. What is human capital? 
workers. Hmm? Workers? Did you say human? Is it related to workers? Or what does it mean, human capital? Are you giving me answers? Can we answer? Sure. Um, skills. Knowledge. Skills. Education. Skills. That's right. Those human capital. Those are resources that relate to labors. Okay. So, and if we talk about labor resources, and we want to build up human capital, you know, the resource can be used. We can use them. You know, you can use it. I mean, if we put objective view into the slave. Okay. If you use using slave and slave can build more human capital and eventually can prosper, then that's a better way of using the labor as a resource, but it's not gonna happen if it's, you treat them as a slave, right? Basically, there's no human capital is gonna build, you know, for slaves, okay? So here we talk about human capital, the skills and uh, the professionalism and, uh, and experience, you know, those are resources, you know, we, don't, we want them to grow. Okay. Uh, then um, in the last part of that, the, um, the last part of the section, um, it talks about the South, Af the South African state um, uh, created dual economy, pre preventing 80% of the population from taking part in skilled occupations, commercial farming, and entrepreneurship. Um, so that's uh, growth. Mm -hmm. That is growth. That means the resources growing more resources. Um, and then all this not only explains why industrialization passed by, passed by large parts of the world, but also encap encaps encapsulates how economic development may sometimes feed on and even create the underdevelopment um, in some other part of the domestic or the world economy. So sometimes, you know, that it may be, you know, the world, I wouldn't say the world, but like the country looks just fine, plenty of... Um, Plenty of opportunities, plenty of resources for you to take things, you know, they may even have um, an economy where jobs are easy to come by, the work is good, but then things come along such as this, um, in the dual, such as this dual economy or even things such as like race. Like in the mid 1900s, I believe that um, women basically did not um, receive workers compensation for their work, um, you know. It was also that race also was a thing that was a factor in choosing how much social social security uh, enunciation um, you know it, that you that you would get things such as that it may not have to, it doesn't have to be some sort of developing country where you see on TV with you know you know you don't have to look at um, Angelina Jolie you know walking around with their children all around like not like that type of thing um, it could be like Belarus like Belarus it has you know such a great economy it's blue it's booming if you want to say but domestically as well the way that they um the, you know the way that their resources such as the workers and the people are their human capital kind of is a little bit um it is a bit it is a bit low um a lot of high suicide rates and alcohol and alcoholism things there so sometimes the factors don't always have to also be um the leaders themselves. It can also be the social aspect that is happening um, within the environment, within the economy, that can also help um, shape, shape any of. I'm oh, sorry, shape that. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, what was I gonna say? I had something. It was really great, really deep, and like philosophical, like. If Morgan Freeman said it, it would be like in a movie forever. Uh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Okay. Uh, oh, well, it might come to me. Um, now we just have a little. Oh, did, oh, you were raising your hand. Girl. No, I'm not raising my hand. Oh. Um, <laughs> and then we have we have a little bit of questiones, which now I shall let my my illustrious partner now do. So. What are some reasons that common law countries experience faster economic growth? Uh, it's pretty much because the citizens have a guarantee that their assets will be protected in the future. Okay. And um, it's pretty much exactly what he said, but just elaborating on it, it's because their assets are protected, they're more likely to engage in like the whole market process of 
buying and selling goods and stuff like that. So when they're given more freedom, they're more likely to make advances. So we like in the United States and stuff, we have more advances in technology and that kind of stuff because the citizens have that freedom to, I guess, dream. But <laughs> she was on the right track. This one, this I mean, I guess like a three word or some like one little term that like really helps sum that up that's one little term i'm looking for you did you have your hand it was more so an extension of the pre previous oh yeah go ahead to her which is um since they're protected they're also engaging in the market which also creates competition which prevents monopoly they have the incentive to actually like go out and help the economy and knowing that they're going to be protected and they don't have to worry. Protected against what though? Like contracts being broken or people just taking their property because they feel like it or... But who is the people that are supposed to stop that? Protected against the government. Mm -hmm. One more word, just one more word put on government. What helps? She was on the right track. Is that they're more free to do? They're more free to do things. Um, that they're experiencing faster economic growth. Free to do things. Government. So there's one word that goes after government. Starts with a good old R. Resources. It's a re. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like you can buy one vowel, buy another vowel. Uh, she got it. There you go. I'm funny. What is that? It is the good old government restrictions. Um, you were, yeah, I know. That was re me being really nitpicky. I don't know. I just felt like I feel. I, I don't know. I feel like that that really that really helps you um, give instead of saying more freedom. Well, you know, freedom to do markets. Well, I mean, well, were you free from you know who who was keeping that freedom? You know, was it Aunt Sally? You know, was it Brian? Was it Courtney? Was it even yourself? Psychological things to think about. Um, uh, you know, things such, things such as that, like to know fewer government restrictions. Okay, fewer government restrictions. Oh, yeah, cool. Let's go. You know, let's legalize things. Um, and then would you rather have a... This is probably going to be an easy question for people to answer. Would you rather have a civil law or a common law? Common. <laughs> and why is that, Mr. Sparkin, sir? Because common is more economic growth, mm -hmm. has more economic growth. Okay, but here's one thing to think about. If you have fewer government restrictions on things, and the free market is now more free, like say government was to say like, okay, you guys want free market and everything, okay then. We're barely gonna touch it at all, only when we see some shady stuff that's happening. Other than that, you guys can control, you know, your prices or everything. You know, say you had, cause you know, common law doesn't always have, isn't always exactly like a, it has to be this much government regulation with these amounts of rules. That just means sort of the judicial branches and more of it. Government is now free. Now, some countries can determine how free it is. Like it's free like, Okay, you know, let's have tax free Saturday, you know, on this day in the Black Friday. You know, you can have those things. Some are like, hey, go nuts. There you go, barter. In fact, you know, cool, sell your daughter for some J's. All right, cool. You know, that's the sort of thing, you know, that you could also kind of think about. You know, people want to put away civil law. Um, but the thing is also that in the other big one, um, about the one Hayek must be right, is that the reason why civil law exists? is because, once again, French, because during, that was around the time of the French Revolution, where um, a lot of, basically to say the least, a lot of ish went down, uh, and it caused them to create that system. Um, and then in Britain, it was a different story because Britain was more of a thing where La, 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 la. Um, the king it was a monarchy and monarchy was going on you know people didn't want like oh this one person is holding me down mom you can't tell me I can't go out with my friends mom no I want to do this you know and then you have the civil law which is post about mid post French revolution where it's like okay 
we have nobody to do anything and everybody's just going around doing whatever they want. I woke up and then all of a sudden some my neighbor was just like sleeping in my bed holding a Teletubby. What the heck is going on? You know, things like that. They want a structure there. But because now all of a sudden it was changing because they're going through so much change of a new government that it became unpredictable. Um, and that's what came, made that go along. Uh, it's sort of a hard catch-22 between the two of them. Good. It's an opportunity cost. Um, kind of a weird question, but so I know for the U.S. we have a wage system. Does that apply to New Zealand and the U.K. as well? Um, not the same. Of once again, like I said, common law systems and even just economies themselves share a lot of um, similarities, but in some time, but in some ways, um, they also kind of don't. Um, like such as currency. Currency is different, is, has different of equal value if you were to convert it, you know. Um, like I believe in U.S. currency, one unit of units currency is like point, is it point something in British currency or is it the other way around? Uh, one British pound is, a, is equivalent to about two U.S. dollars. Okay, boom, there you go, yeah. Like U.S. dollars, you know, or I guess you could say cost less than I don't know what I call them, BB or British bucks, you know, things like that. Now, New Zealand, I do not exactly, do not exactly know, did not exactly um, take the, sh take the um, chance to look so in depth into their currency and their wages there. Um, but their wage system itself, I'm pretty sure, shares a similarity, but just not in maybe the regulations of how much they get paid, the, you know, the hourly wages, you know, when do they get paid, things like that. Because once again, that also here just differentiates between states and things such as that. Um, I kind of have a question. Like, the economies are different based on countries. What exactly is common between like the common law countries and the civil law? Like, what is the main thing that groups them together? Judicial. Um, once again, because when we're trying to talk about with common law, common law, like we're saying, historically. So, like, common law was, so saying... It's called British common law, and then the other one is French common law. And I hate these legs on this thing. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die from tripping on these things. Um, is that for here, like British, once again, big old king, controls everything. We don't want that. That ain't happening in my house. So then we decided, so then they decided they want more powers under them, such as now we have the little judges. We have little judge people with like the little cake hats and everything and the glasses and they be yelling bully bully all the time in parliament, which is funny. You should see the videos. They just yell bully all the time. She's basically saying BS. Um, then there's the French people. The French people, they didn't want everybody telling them what to do. You know, they're just like, oh, yeah, let's do this. No, they didn't want that. They wanted more of an executive person, one person who could take the reins now and say, we're going to go do this. So in a way, they made their own. They they here were tired of they were tired of one person making the decision. They wanted more people. They wanted more people to make decisions. They wanted less people to make the decisions. So they wanted one person to, sort of like you don't want to be, like with a group, and everybody's yelling everything at once. You know we've all been in that group in high school and middle school where everybody's like well, da, 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 da. you can't you can't make one sort of decision on what to do what to think. Um, you can't hear anybody. You all, so you want one person to do that. But the other hand, some people always have that group, that one person that's just always the person that's in charge or always thinks that they have the right answer and wants to be in charge. So they want, no, let's make this more of a group effort. It's beautiful. Rembrandt, which is lovely. I'm like a Van Gogh over here. Um, and sort of things like that. That's, that's where it comes in. Is judicial more in common, um, more executive, um, in in civil, so that's where it goes to make things pretty short. But um, da -da -da. good example. <laughs> Frank, it's my boy. There you go. He wants he wants to be a preacher. There you go. He got that Jesus connection. <laughs> oh, da -da 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 -da. I believe there was one more thing to be talked up to. Um, what is that? Oh yes, there you go. That was what I was forgetting. Okay, so if the crucial factor in determining a country's life standard of living is the adverse set of legal and cultural institutions it possesses, can you offer suggestions for how the other nations of the world might help in permanently raising 
that country standard in the league? It's number six. Yes, number six in your books that you shall find on page 27. Turn to your book. <laughs> Open your books to page 27. <laughs> Disgusting. Take some time, so that way I know it's different to read, to hear it say it, and then to be able to read and comprehend. So you know you can take your time um, to read, think, digest, do, love. Yes. Wait, I don't know. He speaks. Okay. Um, like, like here in America, you can get like help from the government, so that might improve our people's standard of living. Like, you know, we have like Section Eight and like food stamps and stuff. So yeah, other countries might not have that. I don't I don't know if that like answers the question in the right way. Okay. It's a it's yeah. a nice yeah, it's a nice thought. You know, people putting in their different thoughts and everything to this big melting pot that we call the human individual mind. Anybody else? I know that you have an answer. You're just like I'm so ready to say this answer. Me? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Who has spoken? Rochelle! Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if they, like, improve their health care so that people could live longer and be healthier. Uh, in what sort of um, aspect do you think? Maybe, it, maybe improving their, say, their medicine or maybe cost for, maybe cost for health care? Or, or making it more accessible, like more hospitals. Yeah. Who else got one? Well, if I'm understanding this right, like if the institutions are holding them back, maybe if they had like more like opportunities, like more jobs and stuff that they could go and do, it would increase their standard of living because they'd have more money or more currency to deal with. And yeah. And I think I think a big thing is is the access to education, um, because it seems like the more educated you are, the more likely you're going to be living in a better situation with a higher standard of living. So I think just making it open to the people would. Education? Oh my god, guys, what term does that relate to what we said? Let's say on the count of three. One, two, three. Incentives. No. I was gonna go for human I was going for human capital, but I love the enthusiasm. I love the enthusiasm. Human capital, there we go. Human capital, education, skills, experience, things such as that. So yes, creating a higher human capital also would be able to then create people who can become doctors, go learn, bring back their knowledge, and then such as Ta-da. Good. Anybody else? There's still some people have not talked yet to him. I believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just thinking like incentives, like give him incentives to get an education. Like, so, you know, so you get an education, there's going to be a job waiting for you. Give incentives, like once you get a job, you get like health care insurance, or you get some kind of insurance. So just give him those little incentives. I see you using those terms from Bahobar. <laughs> Have you spoken yet? Not so I'm going to. Ooh, snap. Um, <laughs> increased communication between countries would be the key thing, so that they would know like what countries need what resources and how rich that country is if they need to lower the price so that that country gets what it needs because a lot of people don't have, say, water in some countries. That could be something they could work out between the countries or food or health care. But what determines rich? That's actually a really good philosophical question in general. What is rich? Anybody? That's actually a really good question. Rich. Wealth. Oprah. Big bucks. <laughs> money. <laughs> What'd you say? I said Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know in my mind about that. Well, it depends on what you think wealth is. Like, you can be wealth and knowledge. Or you have a lot of money. Or you have a lot of knowledge. The ongoing. And less wealth. Hey, economics, wealth, wealth is economics. Education, it's a, education is economics, human capital. Um, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. What was it? 
What was my question that I asked before I went philosophical? <laughs> question six on six? in the book. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so wait, who has spoken? Like, raise your hand if you have spoken. Okay. Mm. Yeah, you spoke. You oh, spoke. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Zach, you. Answer six? Yes. Okay. I was, I oh, was thinking the same thing. Just ask another question. Oh, okay. Well, ask another question. Ask questions three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Both Louisiana and Quebec have systems of local law, which are state and provincial, respectively, that are heavily influenced by their common French heritage, which includes civil law. What do you predict is true about per capita income in Louisiana compared to the other U.S. states and per capita income in Quebec compared to the other Canadian provinces? Is this prediction confirmed by the facts? Identify at least two other factors that you think are important to take into account when asserting whether the differences you observe are likely due to the influence of the civil law institution. A lot of people who have not talked answer that question. Some of y'all are like, glad I said something. In my eyes, I, I think there are three people have. Can, can somebody explain the question three for us? Yes. I got you. I got you, sister. Can you just open the Bible to the text? Okay. Let's just Wait. Wait. Read. Read. So, Louisiana and Quebec. Systems of, of local law influenced by their French heritage because civil law, French, they were um, mainly those were where they kind of traveled off to and made settlements and things like that. So their French heritage, they have traces of their um, of their civil law tendencies. Um, and what do you predict um, is true compared to the United States? Um, how our common law, you know, sort of is our per capita income. Um, between Louisiana and the United States, how do you think that those differentiate knowing that Louisiana civil law and U.S. is common law? Louisiana's common law, U.S. is civil, as, um, yeah, sorry. Louisiana civil, U.S. is common. How are they the same? Read, let her read first. Let her read the question. You want to read? Huh? You, does it make sense? No, to the question doesn't make sense. It's a couple of He called him Callie first. <laughs> so you want to hear the answer, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, like, Louisiana and Quebec may find, like, a kind of middle ground. Like, they could take some of the um, ideas of civil law and common law and, like, combine it in some way, since they, they are from the U.S. and Canada. So, like, I mean, it could be a combination, maybe, somehow. Yes, I I see. Yep, right track going on there. How we have, you know, France. So then we have in France. Then basically we have, we got Louis, and then uh, we have Louis, and we have Quebec here. So now they are both though within the great places of you know the U.S. and I don't know what the thing is Canada. There, that's Canada. Um, you know, U.S. and Canada, Louis and you, Louis and the U.S., Quebec's and Canada, like you said, little civil things in the common world um, that you're thinking that they may find um, middle ground. So now, how do you think that that creates their per capita income now, um, since now that you have a hybrid within a common? Capita would be higher with just common law, so maybe it's just a bit lower. Like, is that what you're asking? Yeah. So it would be a bit lower if it were like a combination, since civil law is like part of it. Okay. But what? Yeah. Okay, let me repeat the question. Okay. So both Louisiana and Quebec are under civil law. Okay, so you understand the civil law and the common law the under uh, civil law, okay? And because it's French heritage. So the question asks you, so how would you expect the per capita income 
in Louisiana compared to other states in the United States? Well, because it's a little bit lower, right? Because when they compared the U.S. to Mexico, they were lower than us. Mm -hmm. How about Quebec? Isn't Quebec civil law just like? It's it's civil law. That's right. When how still how? Below? How would you expect the per capita income in Quebec compared to the other provinces in Canada? It's still below, right? Okay, so their expectation is their answers are, are, are lower. Okay, so have you talk? Have you both talk? Or towards the end, that kind. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the reason I asked that question. Do you know why I asked that question? To see what you did the research. In Louisiana, it is true, it's lower per capita income. That's, I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Mm -hmm. But in Quebec, actually it's high, compared with other. I think it's lower than Ontario, but it's not lower uh, com compared to the other provinces. And the worldwide, it's, it's still quite high in Quebec. So, so that is, I thought it was uh, interesting. Any other thoughts or question here? Is there like a bigger gap between the rich and the poor in like civil law than in common law? Well, like if you look at those countries, <laughs> if you look at those countries, their GDP sure. growth, their per capita income, you know, are, are, are lower, yeah. right? Compared to those countries on the common law. Just curious as to why, like, it's actually higher in Quebec. That's a good question. Do some research. Check it out. I was, I mean, I wasn't surprised because I know Quebec is a, a economic, it's, it's a good place. That's right. why, you know, I, so I did a bit of a search. I found out, yeah, the, the, they're lower compared to Ontario. But Ontario, you have, uh, you have Toronto and uh, I think Ottawa, those in Ontario. So you have those big cities. So I expect. You know, per capita income in those places higher, and but Quebec is not low. You know, compared to the other place in Canada and compared to the other place in the in the world. You know, yeah. So check check into what's unique about Quebec. Okay. Yeah, that will have something to do with. I want to. You, you want to finish up? Yeah. Then we, I'm going to kind of give a summarize. You know. Okay. Um. So kids. What have we learned about natural resource endowments? They're, they're just a small part of economic growth. Mm -hmm. What else? Maybe a, maybe like an example of natural resource endowments, anybody? <coughs> uh, Russia has tons of natural resources, but they're one of the poorest, well not poorest, but one of the poorer countries overall for economic growth. Cool. Common law. What is it? Common law is when a lot more people have control over the um, over what's done in like the economy, while civil law is the opposite. Give an example of an extractive um, in, of extractive institutions. Stop it here because they you know it's time to give grade. Okay. But I want to give a pause for our first <laughs> okay. so, so I'm going to give, you know, say a few things about this presentation and also your discussion, okay? And I really enjoyed his his style. You know, it's very <laughs> dynamic, you know. And also, to you say know, least. you know, when he hear an answer, he not just say okay. He will ask, okay, why? Okay, what do you mean? When, when he asks you, I like that. He was quite engaged. He was in charge. You know, I see that, you know, empowerment in him, you know. So I want you to, so that's something you, you, you can learn from him, you know. I think he can be a teacher, in, you know, in someday. <laughs> because of his way of, no, no, I really got that his way. And um, of course, he does not have proper points, you know, but I want every one of you has the slides because that will actually make the presentation better. But one thing, you know, I want you guys to improve 
um, um, there's this, and sometimes, you know, and you, 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 I have to say you guys did a really fantastic job, but sometimes you have to look notes and you really forget, uh, uh, you know, in a really professional presentation that should not happen, you know, you should really know what you're going to talk, you want to say, and not just uh, trying to figure out what you're going to say, okay, so that's something, you know, it's kind of like uh, maybe lose a few points there, you know, and for the presentation, and also what I like about he really um, di digested the material, you know, and that is very important. You know, you can tell, I mean, um, every one of you has talked today, okay, but I can tell you less than 10 people have really digested the material, have really read it thoroughly, less than 10, okay, and it's all in my head, I know who has read it, you know, carefully, who has prepared those questions. Even though, you know, the article can be hard, can be, you know, but for the question for this book, it's two, three pages. It's not hard to read, right? And the questions are not hard. At least the next time, I want you all to prepare those questions. You know, for example, the question is three. Uh, the reason I ask, I want to see who has prepared it. None of them tell me that Quebec's, you know, per capita income is, is not that low. I did the research. I did the homework. Okay, so that's something I want you to do from the next presentation from Thursday. I want you to prepare the question, really delve deep, deeply into those. Okay, and um, what else? Um, so I'm going to give each one of you a grade today and give them a grade. So I'm going to call your name because when I call your name, then it will, uh, I will remember what you have talked about. Then I'll give you a grade. I'm going to post on the blackboard. And you will see how much you you receive today, so you know how should you improve time. Okay, so when I say each discussion, each lecture counts, I do that. Okay, so I'm going to call your name, okay? Edward? Noah? Yes? <laughs> This is this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Trini? Catherine Flax? Screw it. I just skipped this. Wait, I wasn't supposed to do that yet. Wait, no. Courtney Gnaus? Amanda? Coel, Michaela, Alexandria, Catherine, Ryan. Justin, you got to talk more next time, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for the presenta um, presentation, each, you all going to get same grade, you know, but I want you to talk more next time. Okay. Kelly? Brown? <laughs> Christian? Cassidy? All right, okay, so now I record all the grades, then I'm gonna post on the blackboard, and then once you see it, you will see what I mean by participating in the discussion. Really read the material. I mean, when I prepared this chapter yesterday, it does not take me that long time. So if you did not even do what I did, I know you probably spent less than half an hour on this. Okay, that's not what I want to expect from you, from honor college student, no. Okay, at least I said, you know, a couple hours. It's not much each week, a couple hours. This class, there's no exam. It's, it's fairly easy class. The only thing I want to do is read and participate discussion. I don't think this is too much to ask for. Okay, yeah. I want you to take what I said seriously because each discussion counts. You get zero. 
and then average it out as loss of points. But nobody gets a zero. Everybody got a grade. Actually, I feel I'm very generous today. Okay, but I will see how you, uh, how you perform in the future. Okay, but today I'm I'm being generous for some of you. Okay, some of you only speak one time. All right. Okay. So again, thank you for the presenters. Thank <laughs> you.